My name's Matt. I do jujitsu. I've taken you down to the floor and I've choked you. You need to stay where you are. If you move, if you cause me any problems, I'll have to do it again, but I don't want to do that. I want to help you. Sure. So Somebody we've got five elements, striking, throws, ground techniques, stand-up self-defense, and then philosophy um, as part of our system. So you can tell from that already what my definition of jujitsu based on what I train and yours is quite different. Because Even until mid nineties, maybe two thousands, um, mental health was a weakness. Mm. Like I can remember dealing with quite horrific stuff, even in the police, um, stuff you're not meant to see and hear at all. You're not prepared for it. And I remember people like saying, you don't want the, you don't want any support, do you? Like in, in that way. And yeah, his, his joints just started coming out. It was mostly shoulders at the beginning. And then the real pain, like the real dislocations that were lodged in place started. And we realized we had a huge problem with that. Like Jiu Jitsu is the only thing where I can totally lose myself in what's happening there and then. I don't have to think about anything else apart from somebody trying to fill me in. And I, and I love that. So it's like you get a holiday from your head. Welcome back to the Everyday Perspective podcast. Please like the video if you enjoy it and please subscribe to our channel. Today's guest is Hoist Gray C Jiu Jitsu Brown Belt, Matt Mann. Matt, how are you, mate? Good, yeah. Good, happy to be here. Brilliant, thanks for coming on, buddy. I appreciate the time. Um, a lot of people will probably know you from your social media social media handle, um, which is jujitsu is much more than you think. Yes, right. So I wanted to kind of start there, really, because that's a, a big statement. Um, we probably know what you mean, but a lot of people maybe who aren't familiar with jujitsu would be quite interested in, in, in kind of, I guess, where that name comes from and, and what you mean by that statement. Could you, could you explain? Yeah, sure. So I actually came across it by accident. So... I saw an advert for the original Gracie Academy from the 1950s, a mm. black and white one. And I'll send you guys it later, later to look at it. And at the beginning, there's this like Portuguese statement and it says jujitsu is much more than you think. Right. And then it goes into the advert and it's um, about, it's, it's about a guy on a beach and guy comes over, a big muscly guy, pushes him to the floor, takes his girlfriend, walks off. And then the guy, <laughs> it's really, really, yeah. it's a really cool macho advert. Yeah. Guy goes and trains jujitsu for a few months, comes back sees the same muscly guy, like throws him to the floor, arm bars him and takes his girl back. <laughs> Links in his arm. Really, really cool old school advert. So I, I sort of got the name from that. I saw that and thought that's quite a cool concept. I like that. I like the idea of it. But it's also like the depth of it yeah. and what it's done for me. And it, it is um, massive for me. It's it's changed my life, basically, jujitsu. And I'm just glad I found it. It's um, altered my career, my family life, mental health, pretty mm -hmm. much everything really. Yeah, It's adjusted all of it. Yeah, brilliant. So it's not just choking people in arm bars then, huh? No, that's good fun, but it's yeah. the rest of it. It's like a holistic side of it. Yeah. It's totally, totally involved in all parts of life. Yeah, as well brilliant. As it. Yeah, excellent. And you've, you've got quite a, a, a successful um, Facebook channel mm. and, and a, a good Instagram channel as well. What was the inspiration for, the, for that channel and that particular content you put out? I think I just wanted to try to document it because you see a lot of successful people out there who put their channels out, but they're already established in jiu-jitsu. They're like blues, purples. I wanted to do it from the very start, mm. from being literally nothing to see how it changed me over the years. And I thought it's a good thing these days to hand down to my kids. Like they can see me trying to work on my footwork, like basic footwork of just switching your feet as a brand new white belt. I can look back and see how bad my technique was and how it's grown. And it's, um, it, I treat it like a diary. I just try to treat it like a cathartic diary. Mm. So I put my problems on there, how I get around training. COVID was a good one, like how I got around all the training, how I did it, how I managed it. Like I even trained with my kids um, and just try to try to use it to, to work around everything. So that was my motivation for doing it, it was just to have a record. Mm. Like yeah. it can stay there forever. You can pass on. Yeah, nice. I guess in some sort of way, we're building that for you, aren't we? A little bit, mate. Pretty much, mate. Yeah, I've got this, I've got this journey of being ripped constantly for being a white belt. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, awesome, mate. So as I mentioned, you're obviously a, a brown belt under Hoist Gracie, mm -hmm. um, sort of training under Danny McMillan, who's, yep. um, I think, a third degree black belt under Hoist, yep. is that right? Yeah, he's a professor, yeah. Yeah. Yep. Um, so tell us, I guess, you know, had you done any martial arts before starting jiu-jitsu and, and when did you start and how did you find it? So no formal martial arts like that they call what you do in the police is called a home office approved martial art but it's a collection of techniques really um it's not like a formal martial art 
So I'd done nothing really before apart from um, I did some a few kickboxing classes with uh, Nathan Kitchen down in Penzance, mm-hmm. who's a very successful kickboxer. Yep. Did some classes with them, um, only a few though. And I've, I've always tried to find something that would fit me really well. And I've done CrossFit over the years. I've done um, Olympic lifting, all different sorts of things, running, marathons. I've tried everything and nothing really seemed to fit. And I wanted something that I could enjoy that was good for me, that would just allow me to get an output because I've always had, I think I've always had underlying mental health problems and I wanted something to sort of like vent that, but I've never really found anything that was the right fit. So um, I was in the police and uh, 29th of March, 2014, I started. So in the police and one day I was cuffing somebody, going to get them in a car on my own, went over to get them in the car and I couldn't get them in the police car. And I was like, okay. I thought there isn't training for this. I haven't been trained how to deal with that specific thing. And there was a collection of things after that as well, where I was um, in situations and it was always, I get home and think, made it. That was lucky. That was close. But I I didn't want it to be like an accident. I got home safely to my kids. I wanted to get home and be like, yeah, that's how it should work. So you should be trained and capable to deal with all of these different situations. And I just felt like the job was gradually getting more dangerous. Budget cuts, on your own a lot more at night, that sort of thing. And just didn't feel comfortable with the career. So um, I literally typed in self-defense in Plymouth on my phone. And it came up with with Danny, who who at the time was called Self-Defense Plymouth. So dropped him a call. He was really unsuspected on the phone. Quite, like, quite quietly spoken. Yeah, come down, take a look, see what you think, blah, blah, blah. So... Uh, yeah, went down and I didn't go straight into classes. I did a private class with him and it was just a massive eye opener, the the introduction. So I went in and there was Danny there who was, he'd been a black belt for about three or four months at that point, I think. And he was there with one of his students called uh, Sean Blight. Um, he was a purple belt at the time and walked in and I felt capable as a police officer. I felt quite physically capable. I thought, yeah, I've dealt with loads of fights. Um, the same old thing you get now. Now when people come into your gym, they think they're more capable than they actually are. They don't realize how incapable they are. So um, Danny put Sean on his back on the floor and he said said to me, right, okay, let's let's see where you are. Hit him in the face. And I went, oh, I don't want, don't want to hurt the guy. I don't, don't want to injure him. And he said, um, if you touch his face, then he'll probably leave. So um, I want you to hit him in the face. And he just twisted me up and I mean he let me stand over him in a massive position of power and he twisted me up again and again and again and again and again and it just made me think wow this is I need I need this in my life I need I need to have this now so I did private sessions for a while after that because at the time I was too sort of underconfident to go into group classes so I just stuck to private classes and just introduced introduced myself into the system and um, I didn't realize that the the rolling around on the floor existed when I signed up. I thought he just, I thought it was just standing self-defense. So and that's what I wanted. So um, I, I didn't have a clue there was groundwork at all. So I, di- I didn't join for that. But um, obviously since then I've come to love all of it. I enjoy all of it. Mm. Yeah, I love it. And I um, it actually helped cause me to leave the police in a way, I suppose. Yeah, I got, a, I got an offer um, to do a different job. And I thought about it for a year, gave it a whole year, but jujitsu also helped me decide to leave. Is it because that you realized how unprepared you were for your job or other people were unprepared for their job? Yeah, you I think know, because I, when you, when you do jujitsu and like you said, you walk in, someone walks in who's never yeah. done it and they think they can handle themselves. They don't, they can't. So again, it must be really frustrating as a policeman. Mm. You must be like screaming at people, like just get a jujitsu gym. Yeah. Because... It's like a superpower. It's like a superpower. It is. Li- it is exactly like that. Uh, um, I'll go into it later with you, but I had an altercation outside the gym, and somebody asked me what it was like, and I said it was like um, I could speak a different language, and so it, it was like somebody standing in front of me speaking Japanese, and you haven't got a clue what they're saying. They know what they're saying, um, but you haven't gotten any idea. And I said that's exactly what it felt like when I had that guy in the street. It just felt like I was speaking a different language. I was fluent in it and he didn't know what I was saying. He had no answers to it. Didn't have a clue what was going on. And it is um, it is literally like a superpower. And I hadn't really felt, I hadn't really felt like that 
until I started training jujitsu. Like I didn't, I didn't feel capable. I always, like I said earlier, I always felt like it was an accident that I got home and I was intact um, and I was cut and scraped and bruised. And not, not to mention the um, inadvertent injuries you can cause another person. Like they've got handcuffs on, they're made out of metal. Um, you know, their wrists are pinned. You need to be capable of moving people around, lifting them, turning them. Um, getting them in and out of police cars. It's, it's important stuff. Body mechanics are huge in jujitsu, jiu- aren't they? Massive. You know? And once you understand that, it makes everything fall into place. Yeah. But until you understand that, it's like... Yeah, it's, it's such an interesting point you just made there, though, about it's one thing being able to defend yourself, but do it without doing more than yeah. the necessary amount of damage. And so that's an interesting point. And that's the, that's the thing, is that um, as a police officer, you never get called to birthday parties. You never go to something good. You always get called to problems, issues. And there's always an assumption, I suppose, that uh, everything in, you go to involves a criminal, a crime. It's not the case. It's not the case. You, you could go to a job where there's a parent who's struggling to safely restrain their child who's got learning difficulties. And they want your help. You know, you've, you've got to go in and help the parents with this situation. But you've got to do it considering the situation itself. And safe. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. You've got to look after them. And that's really tough to do. You've got, to, you've got to really think about what you're doing and how you're doing it. Yeah. And I guess a couple of other things as well with thinking about the police force and maybe the limited training. But we, we all know, sit around the table now, that jujitsu gives you a level of self-assurance and confidence. Mm. And it allows you to kind of maintain a, a, a sort of level of emotion mm. in sort of more... Totally. Yeah, in, in certain situations. And I think as a police officer, being able to maintain your head would obviously allow you to defuse the situation without actually escalating. Yeah. Um, and I guess the other thing is when you see this all the time on the TV shows, but when police are trying to restrain people, they maybe do it in a way that's not particularly efficient, mm-hmm. maybe a little bit overbearing in, in points. And that mm-hmm. causes a reaction then from the person they're trying to yep. restrain, which then just causes it to just escalate. Just escalates, doesn't it? Yeah. It just escalates massively. And you see mm-hmm. it all, all the time, don't you? Yeah. Instagram, and they, they, they always try and pr- portray police in a bad way. Mm-hmm. It's like, oh, look at this policeman. He's fucking useless, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. It's not the policeman's fault. No. It should be coming from above to teach <laughs> teach these techniques to, to their to, to their officers, yeah, and absolutely. then it should you know be passed on because absolutely. they would be a lot safer, yeah. especially in the UK where there's not much like gun crime and all that sort of yeah. stuff. You know, you know if they, if they can take people down safely, handcuff them safely, and get them in a car safely, like you said, yeah, it's like, yeah. your job's a lot easier, isn't it? Massively. Is there, is there an opportunity for for the police to to maybe introduce jujitsu into? into the force because obviously in the military you're seeing it more and more now mm. um, is it something that is potentially likely to happen do you think I know you're out of it now but I can only go by was not is because yeah. I've been out for about eight years but um, I, I tried um, but I think um, if I could be really honest I think there's quite an inherent fear of um, and misunderstanding of what jiu-jitsu is like people um, perceive it to be chokes and um, if you say jujitsu now or um, the word choke to a police officer then they'll immediately think of somebody being restrained on their back being squeezed to death they don't understand that actually um, that mechanism putting someone to sleep to allow them to relax to get them in a position where you can safely cuff them safely move them look after them is better than breaking their arm or ramming them into a wall or dragging them down the street by their, you know, into cars. Them. You see all sorts of stuff online, exactly. don't you? Or, or, just, just, or yeah. just spraying them because they can't get them down <laughs> yeah. to yeah. Reserve, revert to weapons, yeah. It is a, it is a misunderstanding, um, but the only way you can understand it is to be educated. And it's, it's, it's a difficult avenue. It's a difficult area. And um, Danny and I have tried over the years. We're trying again in November. But um, I think that there's also this area where, Perhaps there's a perception that police officers feel that the training should be given to them, not something they should have to take up externally because it's, it's a hard job. It's a very hard job. And I, I'd say it's a finite job. So for me, um, I was like, yeah, that's my time. Done. Done my bit. Tried to do some good. Like to think I did do a little bit, but I was like, that's my expiry date. I don't, I don't think, well, I couldn't have lasted longer in the police because I care too much. If you care too much, then it wears you down over time. And it's, you, you can't keep that going. It's not, it's not good for your mental health. It's not good for your family. It's not good for your life, really. Yeah. It's like, um, the job is like, um, the only thing I can equate it to is like swimming in pollution. You can't do that all the time. You, you, you swim in pollution, you, you're dealing with the nastiest people in the most horrible circumstances, 
with um, a lot of the public against you now and videoing you whilst you're making split second decisions against national decision-making models, uses of force, the law, while you're fighting. But like you've got to process all that. It's not easy, is it? No. No, it's just, they, not easy. We, we've, we've had an ple- ex-police officer on mm. um, earlier on the podcast and we spoke about it in length. And we, yeah. mm. I think I think they've got the impossible job now. Yeah, it's really tough. <laughs> you know what I mean? They, they, they can't do right whichever way they go. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Whichever yeah. way they yeah. go, you know, they... I watched it the other day with um, who's the who's the jujitsu guy that puts a lot of stuff on the boat? Craig Humani, is it? No, nah, the American guy. He's really good. Tom, is it Tom? Tom De Blas. Yeah, oh, Tom yeah. De Blas yeah, is yeah. working. So police, he keeps yeah. he keeps doing putting loads of stuff on. And there was one where he was having a bit of a, a scuffle in the street after a party, and there's a couple of police officers get involved, and um, the police officer involved got a lot of stick because he punched a woman unconscious. Mm-hmm. Um, but they didn't have the right angle. Mm-hmm. And then he was getting like loads of slate. And then they found the other angle. She went for his gun. Right. Mm. She went for his gun. Yeah, Literally, yeah. you can see her two hands mm. trying to pull it out of the holster mm. when he's the other way. He's turned around, he's cracked there, knocked her out. Um, but what that highlights is, is like when they were when they were in altercation originally, the police couldn't handle the situation yeah. because they were fighting them, not being able to restrain the people yeah. that they needed to. More and more people get involved. And then you've got some crazy woman just trying to take yeah. your gun. And then it's like this big thing. And like, I think Tom DeBlas was saying, it didn't need to be all this. No. I think if it was controlled initially, if the officers knew how to take someone down, if they knew mm-hmm. how to restrain, it wouldn't have got that much because alcohol's involved. Yeah. And alcohol's involved. It gets worse and worse. And then as soon as he like knocked that woman out, they got a million times worse. Yeah, of course. Yeah. You know, from there, it goes boom, boom, boom. And then like, you know, <laughs> shots are fired. Yeah. The big tide change for me was when, um, and I, I don't know, I can't think what was happening at the time culturally, but um, I remember there just came this period of time where wearing the uniform no longer mattered. Like the the level, the the respect the uniform would get, as in people would go, we won't fight him. He's a police officer. It just changed. It just it just switched off one day, and you go to jobs, and all of a sudden it didn't matter. It'd be like turning up in a t-shirt, and then it was like, ah, now I've got a problem because the person you're with didn't respect that. Yeah. They didn't respect the justice system, and they just thought, I'll see what I can do. And the the violence escalated. It, the violence did escalate. There's no no other way around it. And um, at the time, budget cuts, changes of government and stuff, and it just it was a hard job. I mean, I, I massively respect anybody doing it. I really do. But the the way it is now, um, and that people find me a bit much sometimes is um, as I raise my children, I'm training them to to be their own backup. Like them, I I get them into jujitsu. I teach them about stuff, about locking the doors and crime prevention advice and that sort of thing. So that when they're older, they don't need to rely on anybody like that. Mm-hmm. If somebody broke into my house, um, I call the police after I dealt with it. So I, I deal with everything first and I'd say, now can you come and take this person away? But I wouldn't necessarily use them as much as I would have done anymore. And it's because they're not as readily available mm-hmm. and people need to accept that, but also accept the responsibility that if the backup isn't coming, you need to sort yourself out to a degree and take some responsibility. Yeah. What's going on, guys? This episode is sponsored by Eden Clinic for Men, who specialise in men's health and male hormones. The details are on the screen now and in the description below. Head on over to their website and get yourself booked in for a blood test. Select EDP, which is the everyday perspective, to get yourself a discount. In addition to male hormones such as testosterone, these tests also look at other health markers such as diabetes type 2, heart health, liver function and kidney function. The clinic is run by Dr. Angela Service, who featured on episode 13, where she spoke in length about the negative symptoms that men can experience if they're deficient in some of these hormones, such as low mood, low libido, fatigue and weight gain. So if either you, maybe one of your mates, your dad isn't feeling quite right, then it's worth having a look at some of these metrics and some of these markers to see how your health is on the inside. Even if you are feeling tip-top, it's worth having a look now because in the future that may change and it gives you the ability to look back and have a benchmark. This is something that we feel really passionate about, guys, otherwise we literally wouldn't be telling you about it. Dr. Angela Service and her team can work wonders in regard to getting things corrected and improving your life and your health. It isn't something worth taking a chance on, fellas, so get on over and get yourself booked in. Awesome, guys. Thanks for your time. Back to the episode. So let's talk about jujitsu then. So we were really kind of excited to hear to speak to you because I think we do a style of jujitsu which is probably more sort of competition and, and sport based. I think a lot of a lot of jujitsu you see now, especially the stuff online, is sport based and competition based. Um, and it seems like you've almost 
got the sort of slightly sp a slight split in the styles now where you've yep. got more of that yeah that kind of hybrid jujitsu which has a mixture of wrestling and everything else yep. and you know you see it a lot in mma and that type of thing um but obviously massive in competition mm -hmm. personalities like gordon ryan craig jones yep b team kind of really highlight it and then you've got the kind of i guess more traditional style which mm -hmm. is focused around self-defense and it's this age-old question isn't it what's the best martial art for self-defense mm -hmm. and I'm a massive advocate of jiu-jitsu, but before I did jiu-jitsu, I did Muay Thai. Before I did that, I did boxing. So when people say does jiu-jitsu work in self-defense, well, yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. But that's with the caveat of me knowing how to manage distance, how to cover up when people are throwing shots, yep. to get hold of somebody to then apply jiu-jitsu techniques. Whereas someone, if they've just only ever done jiu-jitsu, yeah, I don't know. I don't know if they've, if they, if they, if they've never done a striking art, mm -hmm. if they're not, you know, haven't grown up in a rough area scrapping and they've just got jujitsu, um, the, you know, the, the sort of sport-based jujitsu and it, and it kicks off in a street fight. I don't know how effective that would be. So it's interesting to hear from somebody who does more of that self-defense style and straight away when you mentioned about your introduction, that was completely alien to me where it was like, hit this guy because that isn't something that a lot of people now associate with jujitsu. It's the ability to go hard without strikes mm -hmm. So can you tell us a little bit more about Gracie Jiu-Jitsu or, or host Gracie Jiu-Jitsu yeah. specifically and and how the self-defense element works, how it's structured? Yeah, so, sure. So we've got five elements, striking, throws, ground techniques, stand-up self-defense, and then philosophy um, as part of our system. So you can tell from that already what my definition of Jiu-Jitsu based on what I train and yours is quite different because um, when you're saying about jiu-jitsu and then striking arts mine is mm. so i'm like but it is and i find I've, and that's that's a, a good initial divider really mm. so we we do train for common attacks um so we train headlocks pins against the wall chokes restraints weapons um that have most commonly been seen to come up in altercations his, historically and currently so we we cover all of those um we we do deal with strikes we do train striking we train to deal with different forms of strikes as well and we need to be proficient in it so part of that will involve clinch work so how to close distance using strikes how to get your arms wrapped around somebody using the correct grips and how to take them down or um, lift them in the air but um, for ours and this is this might be a, a strange concept but we go to the ground um, by necessity not choice so if we have to go to the ground to execute a technique, we will. However, if we can take somebody down, we'll, we'll arm bar them from standing. We won't throw the leg over and sit back like you traditionally see. So ours is about um, staying standing. If we go to the floor, it's um, standing up as soon as you're able to. Mm. So you're safe. Yeah. Um, that um, restricts what we do train because we don't train a lot of sportive techniques. Mm. Um, so you won't see us inverting and stuff. You won't see us doing barambolos and that sort of thing. We won't do a lot of techniques where our grips are um, occupied against a person that isn't, hasn't got occupied hands. Mm. So we'll, we'll deal with covering and stuff during our training. And that, I think that's part of why I love it is because that introduction I got was exactly what I was after. If I'd have gone um, somewhere else or if that if that introduction was different say say if I did go and in a different world it was more of a roll around on the floor thing I might not have stayed because mm -hmm. in my brain I've said but I just won't go to the floor I'll stay standing through naivety mm -hmm. but um, yes yeah, it's, it's a very very different system and the the stand-up self-defense and the curriculums that we follow they're to enable um, anybody to learn them um, and become proficient over a period of time so it isn't like you have to be athletic to pull off any of these techniques. You haven't got to be particularly strong. I, I'm an average guy. I'm not, I'm not strong. I'm not big. I'm one of the smallest in my gyms, actually, really. Um, I'm just average Joe, father of three. But I can pull these off quite proficiently now through, through, like, through 10 years of training that I've done so far. And that's what I like about it. Like mm. my, my kids have had problems in schools. They pulled it off. Um, and my kids out of the... My oldest son, before he got his health condition, maybe seven or eight altercations in school because he's in secondary and they happen all the time. And they've been sort of safely resolved through jiu-jitsu, but involving striking too. Mm -hmm. um, and Tyson, wasn't it? Everybody's got a plan to the punch in the face. Yeah. 
But I, I, I can think of times where I've been training at my academy, uh, particularly one that I mentioned, Sean Blight, earlier. Um, I went to defend the triangle by sitting him on the seat and controlling his legs and pulling his legs back. He punched me straight in the face. And I was like, never using that again. <laughs> but it's there. Yeah. And what would an average person do? Mm-hmm. They, they'd probably do that. Yeah. If you go to put a rear naked choke on somebody, because I, I, I look, I'm a bit, bit of a strange guy. I'll look through fight footage and stuff to see like common reactions and to learn. So you won't see me watching um, like Gordon Ryan matches and stuff. I'll, I'll watch street fights mm. on Reddit. I'll sit there and watch them and learn. And like common defenses um, to like a rear naked choke of people reaching back and scratching your eyes and stuff. So in our system, we're trained to bury our head in the knot of your arms mm. on that side. Just, mm-hmm. just differences like that. Mm. Um, and it's all um, the Helio Gracie I mentioned to you earlier, the Gracie Jiu Jitsu book. The master text it's all tried and tested at the highest level against style against style the, the good old days before people said jiu-jitsu doesn't work in ufc or this and that when it was style versus style you got to see how effective it was against mm-hmm. somebody who didn't know mm-hmm. who didn't know your language and it's all stuff that you train in the class you can go home and you can search it and watch him do it in the ufc against the highest level fighters at the time mm-hmm. which is fantastic mm-hmm. um conor, conor mm-hmm. mcgregor and nate diaz so um, when Nate Diaz flattened Connor out, rolled him to the side and choked him, mm. um, my son said, I did that last week in class. Mm-hmm. It's, it's there. It's in our yeah. system. Yeah, he punched him into the choke, basically. Yeah. Well, <laughs> yeah. I always love yeah. seeing. So we're taught open-handed slaps, get him yeah. to turn into it. Yeah. Um, slap him around the face. Do you, tra- mm-hmm. do, you, do you train like that? Yeah, we train like that. Yeah. In, in, in the gym, yeah. Yeah, yeah we, we obviously have to moderate it and pick who trains what and how and when. But um, I carry gloves in my bag. And what does a typical week I'm just interested in myself. What does a typical week look like? Because obviously when I go to our gym, yeah. I just train jiu-jitsu yeah. straight up, you know, all the time. So will you have different days that do different things? Different yeah, so um, like I said, we, we work from a syllabus. So we're one of the few Hoist Gracie 360 curriculum um, schools in the country. And we work from a curriculum of classes for the adults and the children. And the, they've got different levels to the curriculum as well. But we'll do a um, class of ground and a class of standing on a Monday night. We'll, we'll spar on a Monday night. Next day, again, it will be, well, basically every day of the week, we do one ground class and one standing class. And then we apply it in sparring. And it, it depends who's in that day, what, what you do. If um, one of my main training partners, Ross Burt's in, he'll say, should we get the gloves on? And we go, yeah, okay, let's do that. But it's totally different, mm. totally different. Like you, you do... A two three minute round with gloves on striking with jujitsu. It's it's like ten minutes of, of just sparring. Do you always wear the gear? Uh, not always. No, no, no. So no we'll take gear. that off. Yeah, mm. yeah. Just because it, it's good. I like training with both, and I've I've never really had a massive problem with taking the the gear off. Um, I've always said no gears, just gear without the gear on. It's just you take it off and you carry on. Mm. Like you, you can't grip a gear, hold their neck. It's, yeah. It's well, come quite I, I guess for you, because you commented earlier that you wouldn't occupy grip so much. Mm. Um, so I guess for you, going from a from a, a gear to a no gear would be probably less of a change for someone who doesn't have yeah. that mm. focus because a lot of gear players will rely heavily on grips. Yeah, lapel grips and twisting. Yeah. Yeah. So when yeah. they switch to no gear and they're not there, it's a, a big adjustment to try yeah. and find other levers. But I guess for you then, it probably doesn't matter so much, does it? I mean, if you look back at the original UFCs when they were when they were actually really decent, yeah. like the original first UFCs, you'll see Hoist and Izzy, and you mm. can you can see its effectiveness and how it works. Um, but he wouldn't over occupy his hands to despite his face. Yeah. He wouldn't leave himself open to do anything like that. Mm. Um, and that's how we train. So we we do do a lot of um, you know, collar grips and stuff to to choke. Mm. But it the the kimono, the point of it is to mimic street clothing. So yeah. it's the same thing. Like your yeah. your top today would take a bit. Mm. t-shirts not so much but you can stretch yeah. t-shirts roll them up the back and choke mm-hmm. so we learn that sort of stuff too so um if somebody is no gi like your t-shirt there could i get collar grips in no i couldn't but if i roll your shirt up your back i can use it exactly like a collar on a gi mm. pull it up your back during a street fight you've got so a do, you, on do you practice stuff like that yeah, yeah, yeah i practice it at home class, so. i'm quite fastidious for stuff like um in the police one of my downfalls is i wanted to know everything all the time like <laughs> current, current knowledge and it's very hard to keep up with all the law all the time. But I didn't like knowledge gaps. So I'll, I'll study at home from books. I'll teach my kids. I'll watch videos. But I keep it all ancillary to what I do. But yeah, I'll, I'll learn that sort of stuff for the what ifs. Yeah, it's good, man. Yeah, I think the, uh, 
I, I, I'd probably refer to it as jits with hits, but um, it, it does fucking change it a lot. Oh yeah. So it's about, like so about combat jujitsu. Jiu- yeah, doing, similar to that. But I used to do a bit of MMA, so mm. we would often use striking yeah. and doing in jujitsu. And yeah, you, it, you're right. It does fucking change it. <laughs> but you go and just, but, but even just little taps, just yeah. little knocks to the face, just to stun somebody for a second yeah. as you, as you transition, it really mixes it up. It's look very that, different. Look at that combat jujitsu you just yeah. mentioned, where they have open handed slaps and look at the highest level grapplers in the world fold their knees to their face to mm. protect themselves, and they yeah. pass their guard and they got them. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it changes all of it. Really, it changes everything. Yeah, it, it, does. it literally does. Yeah. It? You know what I mean? Like. We, I was doing some tra- training with Jamie the other day, like I said about his MMA fight, mm. and he was like asking me stuff, and I was like, oh, yeah, but I wouldn't do this if I was in an MMA mm-hmm. fight because <laughs> if you're in this position and you and you're going for the hips for a, an escape, yeah. it's just gonna yeah, chin yeah. you, yeah. You know? So, so li- little changes thing, everything. Little things like um, Americana from mount, right? If you're going to try and get an Americana arm lock from mount position, how would you set it up? Push the arm down. Push the arm down. How would you get the arm up? How would you mean get it up? How would you get the arms in the position to push it down in the first place? So we oh, like by hands. relying on them blocking. So for our style, we get their arms up by hitting them in the face. Mm. They bring their arms up to shield. Yeah. So like my kids are trained to, if anybody causes them a problem and they have to use self-defense and they mount them, hit them in the face, they'll put their arms up, mm. then American arm lock them. It's just that little difference in- And that's like, how you train. That's how like in the, in the gym, that's how you would train that? At, at times, not all the time yeah. because if you got somebody who was like learning and starting, you imagine the white belt journey, if you could involve strikes. I mean, mine was, <laughs> mine was harrow in any way. Like mine was tough, like tough. Um, starting off, I found really difficult, but imagine that with strikes too, you'd be a mess, wouldn't you? Oh yeah. So you, you've got, you've got <laughs> a sort of, exactly. <laughs> so you've got, you've got to pick and choose, but there's nothing wrong with simulating stuff, mm. you know? Um, and you'll often, we'll, we'll be rolling in the gym and you'll often see it where, um, you look over and somebody will be just going like that and just tapping. Mm. To say, this is here, just be, be aware of it. And it's good to educate people in that way and sort of nurture that. A yeah. lot of people we get are there, they're normal people who are accountants, mums, um, they just come in for self-defense. Mm-hmm. So it's a different breed of people than those that might be in the gym lifting and eating a certain way to be athletes for jiu-jitsu. Yeah. Different so it's, a, it's a bit more like out of flow in it, as in people are there to compete you mm. know we are there to compete train hard and yeah that's very different to what you do but what we do do which i actually really like is we differentiate so on our belts that we have so um the black bar like you'd see the promotional bar that you have on a belt ours is uh dark navy blue okay um because uh, we we differentiate like i i don't pretend to be something i'm not like if you if you have somebody that does sportative jiu-jitsu and let's say in four months time, you put on a self-defense course. Um, your area is sports jujitsu. My area is self-defense. I wouldn't put on a sports, um, some sort of a worm guard course and you wouldn't put on a self-defense course. Mm-hmm. So it's, it's knowing your lane. Mm-hmm. The, the only danger you get is when people change lanes. That, yeah. That's the problem you get. Like you shouldn't try to teach something you're not fully competent in. Yeah, I think that's why it's nice to have those differentials, like the belts a little bit different mm. because it shows that I'm, I'm not pretending to be you, you're not pretending to be me. It's a different style almost. So style. in your gym, you have two different colors on those yeah. strips. So you have one that has black. And so I, one that's so blue, I have yeah. my brown belt and where the black section yeah. would mm-hmm. be, the bar, it's dark blue, navy blue. Mm-hmm. And then other people in your gym, they'll have a black version of that. Who do the sport one? Uh, no, this, oh, we, all, we all wear those. All wear the blue. All wear those okay. to differentiate. Yeah. So in, in our system, that's what we choose to wear. And okay. the, the reason why it's that color is because in the original Gracie Academy, um, in the simpler days, because like, I think it was uh, 1967, you had the Jiu-Jitsu Federation of Guanabara was formulated and the belt systems were introduced. Sort of like looking, looking at judo, belt systems were introduced to Jiu-Jitsu. And, um, you know, we have the, um, the belt that we've got now, it's got the, the dark bar on it. The reason why it's got that dark bar is because they used to have white belts for people who are total beginners. And then they used to have people that, that had trained, um, had a blue belt and people that had done Grandmaster Helio Greasy's course, professor's course, wore a dark blue belt. So it's only those three belts. So if you trained for 10, 12 years, you wore, you wore a white belt, mm-hmm. like the simpler days mm-hmm. of it before belt systems were introduced. So we wear that band, that bar to basically mimic his belt color. As, as a symbol of respect for the self-defense. Yeah. It all went a little bit wrong um, historically because 
when the belt system won, was introduced in 1967, um, people started to compete and do competitive jiu-jitsu. And from there, it becomes um, similar, we were saying earlier with the police, you, you learn to beat the rule set, not beat the person. Yeah. You, you learn to, to do what you can within a particular rule set. And because of that, the, um, the style of jiu-jitsu got um, not misconstrued, I don't wanna say that, but it got misdirected. It went in a different direction than was intended. And people started trying to beat the rules rather than beating the person. Um, and it went off on a different path than, than people like Helio in, intended. So they, they withdrew from that, they, they stepped away. And in almost protest, he, just, he took his belt off and he wore the dark Navy belt from then on mm. as a way of saying, I'm not the same. I'm not mm -hmm. part of that anymore, I don't wanna be. Interesting. Yeah. I didn't know any of that. <laughs> no, I didn't know. Okay. Um, you mentioned that philosophy was <clears throat> a component of, of your style of, mm -hmm. of jiu-jitsu. Um, I'm interested to hear about that in a second, but I just wanted to, to touch on one thing and this may well cover it, but you kind of mentioned um, about staying in your lane with sort of uh, self-defense and that mm -hmm. type of thing. And it's an interesting comment because I've seen um, and, and have a really strong opinion about some styles of self-defense yep. because I think where you can, you should diffuse and evade yep. situations totally. rather than feel like you're in a position where you can actually com be compatible with somebody. And mm -hmm. I think some some self-defense systems will teach women and men and whoever these fucking shit techniques yep. or sometimes some okay techniques, but give them a false confidence that in a, in a real, yeah. you know, sort of a situation, mm -hmm. they should actually apply this and they'll be okay. Yep. And, and that really fucking winds me up because yep. you can really injure and, and put people in danger. Yep. So in regard to the, maybe the philosophy and the, and the self-defense system of, of your style, um, is that sort of stuff covered as like a prerequisite to actually mm -hmm. getting hands on with somebody? Do you cover like evading and, and, and diffusing? Yeah, we do. Yeah. And um, it's fantastic because uh, the academy where I train with Miller Martial Arts and Motley Plain, it's like a big filter. That's the working word. It's like a big filter and it just sifts things out. And generally the people that, that may come along rarely who aren't there for the correct reasons naturally leave after a short period of time because they just perhaps feel uncomfortable and don't fit. Why don't they fit? Because they, they're coming in and they're learning a system where in order to use this style of self-defense, by, by definition, you have to have an attack. So if somebody doesn't attack you, you can't apply what's in this book, really, because the attack is not there. So what, what are you doing? Um, you can't defend being pinned against the wall if no one's pinning you in the first place. You have to have that attack. Mm. Also as well, um, philosophy is a very, very broad term, obviously, but you can't survive in jujitsu without your mask eventually slipping. Even if you come into the system and you think, and, and you've got underlying issues or you're there for the wrong reasons, perhaps, um, you can't keep doing something that brings the honesty out of you so much for so long that you won't reveal what you're actually like. Um, so you can't really pretend to be a different sort of person that's got bad intentions and, and do jiu-jitsu, mm. any jiu-jitsu, mm -hmm. sport jiu-jitsu too, because after a while you'll tap them five, 10 times and they'll start punching the mat and you'll go, right, okay, <laughs> that's, that's a small crack. But then you'll go further, that's another small crack. And you notice, mm. you notice these small little issues that somebody might have that, that show that maybe they lose their temper, maybe they take things too far. Mm. And that's, that's what part of this is about. We always educate the children, we always educate the adults. If you can leave, leave, de-escalate. If there's an exit, go out the door. Don't, don't stand there. Mm. And we almost train it like if you're, if you're stuck in a phone box and somebody's blocking your door, do this. Mm -hmm. um, but it isn't the sort of thing where you approach danger. Um, really interesting one that opened my eyes for me in years back was I went traveling to a Guy Valente seminar in Amsterdam with Danny McMillan. So um, black belt, um, absolutely ridiculously solid martial artist in many areas. Um, and we're going, walking down this street and there's um, like a, a cut through to get back to our hotel. And I looked down and there's a group of kids there, two or three kids. And I said, why don't we go that way? And he went, I'm not going down there. And I was like, why not? And he said, there's three of them down there. I'm not stupid. And I was like, but you're a black belt. He's like, I said, they're only kids. And he's like, it's not self-defense. It's stupid. Just take the longer route. Mm -hmm. And that, that really rocked me. I was like, why did he say that? He's a black belt in jujitsu. He can handle himself. But he was almost like, I don't need to use that. I'll just walk around. It'll take me a minute longer. It's fine. Mm. And that's that's what I like. 
It's like teaching people if there is another way, use it. De-escalate, talk, move back, put your hands up like this. You'll see in our gym a lot. Just stay back over there. You don't need to come any closer. Mm. But if somebody does make those adjustments, if they do move, if they do, do give you the white knuckles, then you use your technique. So. Yeah, such an interesting point. It's similar to what uh, the, Mr. Bassett said from Grappler Soap. Mm -hmm. And he talked about doing a dynamic risk assessment <laughs> and talked about a sort of similar scenario where you're walking down the street and there's a couple of old women, mm -hmm. midday, fine. But then if it's midnight, you're like, mm. And then if it's a couple of lads, you're like, mm. And then if it's a group of lads, you're like, right, okay, let's go another way. It's yeah. such an interesting point. It's so true. I went to college with him. Did you? I went to college really? with Dan. Really, really <laughs> random. Is the, well, just like, well, it was hard. Was, was, it was he hard mental years. back then? Oh, he's, yeah, he's, he was hard work back then. He was, he was <laughs> I think he is now, wasn't he? He was hard work back then, but now he's big and solid and muscular. <laughs> like, he wasn't big when I went to college yeah, with him. Okay. But um, yeah, I went to college with him and um, I think I actually shared that, that post you mentioned. Um, and we, we met up again through jiu-jitsu. I just thought, oh, I'll get the bar of soap. Yeah. Yeah. He was like, man, man. Yeah, so God damn, what's going on? <laughs> yeah, it's really weird how you sort of like come back together after all these years. But mm. he's he's a very intelligent guy. He yeah. knows a lot yeah. and he's um he's done his research and he's got a lot of valid points. Mm. Yeah, well, I really like his message. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's, podcast, uh, yeah. it's really impactive message. And I think that's why he's got such a, a following behind him is that um the w one thing that I would say about Dan that is similar to me is I'm not a, I'm not a yes man. I won't just go along with something. If mm. I don't agree with it, if you said something now I didn't agree with, I'd just say, sorry, I'm not going to do that. Yeah. Um, I've never been that way. And it, it makes you unpopular. You get these big divisions. I think it makes you unpopular, but also it can make you very popular. Yeah. And that's what Dan's got. Yeah. You either love him or hate him. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and that's because he'll just say how it is. Yeah. And you can't deny the message, really. Mm. A lot of what he says is strong stuff and it's backed up with intelligent research. I, I love his, his videos of the fucking Sasquatch thing. Yeah. <laughs> amazing. You know, mate, amazing. They're amazing. getting me all the time. Yeah, amazing. It's a fucking grown man. I love it. Yeah. <laughs> Do you know yeah. what I mean? Amazing. <laughs> yeah, no, he's good. Um, so you, you mentioned earlier, mate, about there was a situation where you had to use this in, mm. in real life. Can you tell us about that? Yeah. Um, so that, that was a really um, difficult stage of life, like the worst. So um, my son had not long been diagnosed with EDS at the time, uh, Ellis Danlos syndrome. We were in hospital 40, 50 hours a week in a and &E, like watching him get his joints put back in forcibly. So I was mentally wrecked mentally wrecked and I was trying to get some stability back in life so I went into the academy because I teach on a Tuesday night and I was like right I'll go in and teach I'll go in get a bit of normality so I'd, I'd done a few done a few weeks of this like here and there but yeah. obviously with his health being so sporadic I couldn't commit to it totally so went in to to go and train trained at the academy really enjoyed it and was locking up and pulled a shutter down and there was a like an old caravan um, parked on the pavement outside the academy so you couldn't really see around it couldn't see around it at all and I was looking up just having a, a chat with this this guy I know who'd also just trained with me pulled the shutter down the shutter's quite loud and as I pulled it down I just heard this guy just shouting and I, I couldn't tell where it was coming from because this caravan was there I couldn't see through it there was blinds on it and he was just shouting um, like do that again I'll fucking kill you and that sort of thing and I thought what's, what's that all about I could hear it and I could hear that it was close I thought I can't see him okay um, right okay so I was looking up and listening and he was just swearing shouting angry you could tell he was angry um, and banging into stuff and everything so um, locked, locked the shutter went round the side and the, the guy was in front of us and he, he started walking in the direction my car was and I was like, oh, okay, here we go. Um, so hung back, spoke spoke to my friend who was there at the time and said, um, we'll hand back a second. He he started walking, left distance. So I thought, give, give him space, let him move down the alleyway. So he got about halfway down the alleyway and then I started to walk to my car. And um, I was just saying goodbye to my friend, like, yep, see you later, mate, no worries. And he's like, I'll walk through with you just in case. I was like, yeah, no worries at all. So we started to walk through and um, the guy just turned around straight away and he was like, um, just angry, just aggressive, angry. And I, th I think it wouldn't have mattered who it was, who was there in the alleyway that night. And he turned around and ran at us. The person I was with sort of ran halfway between me and him and deflected him off, like hit him and he deflected off and he came towards me and it, it was literally like a class. I was like, perfect. He's going down, his posture's lowered. So I held him on his shoulders like we we're trained to in class, just went to an angle took him down to the floor and he was on his hands and knees. So got my hooks in, flattened him out, rotated his wrists inward to pin his wrists below his body. Mm -hmm. 
And then I mean, he, he was probably, um, I don't know, mid to late 40s. And he probably had 20 kilos on me, mm. wearing like a brown leather jacket, which was quite hard to, to grip, even though it's thick. It was quite tricky. Uh, flattened him out. Um, and I put on a rear naked choke. And he was out within six, seven seconds, I reckon. Mm. Uh, didn't take very long left him for a second and it was, it was very clear when somebody goes out it's like a reset it's like toy story it's like woody when andy comes in the room he, he literally just turned off and i was like right he's out now so I released it and like you said earlier it's having the presence of mind to be like one two in that moment and not panic and think oh my god this guy can't get up i'm gonna i've got to keep him on the floor mm -hmm. i just count and i was like one two okay he's out right let him go and it's having having that about you so i, I let him go released the choke, how tight it was in his neck and just held him, kept my balance out because he was big. And then um, sat up, slapped him around the face to wake him up because I didn't want him to wake up on his own time and be erratic. Mm. So I slapped him around the face to wake him up. He woke up and then I just mentioned what you did earlier. I, I just said, my name's Matt. I do jujitsu. I've taken you down to the floor and I've choked you. You need to stay where you are. If you move, if you cause me any problems, I'll have to do it again, but I don't want to do that. I want to help you. Something doesn't seem right with you. I'm not sure if you're ill because he, he came across as having mental health issues. Mm. So I'm not sure if you're ill, but I don't want to hurt you. Please just stay where you are. And I just talked him down. Mm -hmm. um, my friend who was there called the police. 22 minutes. It took 22. I'm tapping my finger because it was annoying. 22 minutes of, of me restraining the guy on the floor. Um, and I just got by by de-escalating it, just having a chat with him and just hitting him on a personal level and just trying to keep him calm. And he, he, he reached for his keys at one point in his pocket to mm -hmm. bring him up, which was worrying, but that, that got dealt with. My friend controlled his wrist um, and we, we managed to get the keys off him. But um, I just calmed him down as best I could, mm. which is weird, isn't it? To have that with somebody, then calm him down mm. and talk to him. But by the end, like he shook my hand when he left. When the police did turn up, I was never concerned that I'd have to justify my actions because in my head I was like, right, okay, this happened, that happened. Simple. I, I never felt like I was going to be taken away or anything or, or anything like that, and I, and I wasn't. Mm. So they turned up, I explained what happened and um, got the guy up and they said, what What do you want done? It was, it, he told me when we were on the floor that he was off his meds and he was having a really bad day and he didn't know what to do and he was angry, he wanted to hurt somebody. Blah, blah, blah. And I just just said to the police, just take him home and get him the help he needs. He doesn't need to be arrested, clearly. He needs some help. So mm. try and get him that help somehow, but don't cause him any further problems. It's, it's no good taking him to a police station, locking him in a little room when he's angry. Just try and get him the help he needs. And I think um, that's all part of the de-escalation as well. Mm. I'd, I'd like to think that he did get the help he needed and it did help him out. But yeah, it was, it was, a, it was a funny event. It was a really bizarre time for me really bizarre time because because everything was going wrong in my personal life with with my son you feel like that knocks on and you feel like your training's not as good and you're not as good as a person you're underconfident you're tired um so that that came at a time in my life where it sort of actually reminded me why i train um and how i train too like mm. if i'd have lost my temper it, it would have been much easier to sit up and fill his face in mm. much easier much easier like it wouldn't have taken as much to do but it's having that presence of mind the philosophy to do something using what you need to use but not too much like not taking it too far mm. especially against somebody who's ill he, he's sick he's not he's not a criminal he's not out to to rob me or anything he's a person that's mentally ill so they need help and support not not getting punched in the face not getting injured yeah how did how were your emotions at that point because obviously you said you had a bit going on and mm. as trained as you are, I think in a real life situation, you know, the, the adrenaline and the other hormones are going to mm. kick in. Did you, did you kind of, you know, were you in shock at any point or did you feel pretty level the whole time? I was talking to myself, having a conversation with myself in my head at the time that I remember really vividly. And um, I was like, <clears throat> break his posture, take his back, get your hooks in. I was coaching myself through it. <laughs> but I, I remember saying to myself, he doesn't know what I'm doing. I remember that in my head like he doesn't know what he's doing he doesn't he doesn't understand this you've got him fine you're good but it, and in my head i was like base you know like balance and i was like base 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 just give myself little cues like don't relax you, you see all these videos of somebody getting someone to the floor restraining them dealing with it all then the police take a while to come and they loosen their grip a little bit 
and then that causes the further problem. So I was like, right, I've just got to be all over this guy like a rash. Like, mm. don't don't get sucked into anything just in case. Like, be aware that this could just be a bit of a ruse. So mm. just be on him, be heavy, make sure he can breathe, turn him to his side a little bit. Because, you know, that's another thing about training is people train a lot, but they don't train aftercare. If somebody got attacked on the street and put on a rear naked choke, they'd let them go and just let them hit the floor like a rag doll. Uh, you've got to have aftercare. And yeah. that's, again, part of the philosophy, like looking after somebody. You might have to injure them, but that doesn't mean you have to leave them injured. Mm. You can look after them and get them the help they need after because mm. the problem's gone. As soon as it's dissipated, you've finished with what you need to do. So look after them. Don't just leave them in the road or... We were in a cobbled street by Mutley. Like my, um, I actually had to get people to help stop cars coming through and everything. And just after it happened, literally just after, this like delivery driver popped out and he was like, oh, could have been me, couldn't it? Mm. I was like, could have been, mate. Mm. Could have been. There was a, a ladies dance school there. They started coming out and I thought, thank God it was me. Yeah. Could I have walked around the block? Yes. Could I, could I have? Yes. But I was worried for other people in that situation. Mm. Well, I've thought about it a lot and dissected it and thought, should I have walked around the block? Could I have walked around the block? And I thought, actually, maybe I was the right person to do that and not injure him. He wasn't yeah. injured. Yeah, it sounds like you did a really good job of that, mate. It's You hear about it so often, don't you, where... For many people, that would just escalate into a fist fight, mm. and especially on a cobbled street, someone gets dropped, yeah, and hits their head, and that can be a, it can fucking end very, very badly. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah, yeah it was. I, I mean, I, I had a chat with uh, Danny after, like it happened. I told Danny, he said, "I'm coming meet you for a coffee tomorrow." I sat down, and um, he sort of walked me through it, and he said, "You did, you did what you needed to do, like, like well, well mm -hmm. done." Um, he looked after the person afterwards. He got them the help they need. And he said, that's that's what this is all about. That's what, that's what we train for. This is why I teach you. This is what you should do. Mm -hmm. This is what our kids should do. Like you deal with a problem, but afterwards you get them the help they need. That's that's what it should be all about. Yeah, brilliant, mate. It sounds like you handled that really well. Um, and just wanted to ask real quick as well, because obviously that's one scenario where you can apply your style of jiu-jitsu. The other, of course, is is competition. Mm -hmm. And we've obviously talked already that that isn't really a focus of your academy at all. But do, do, do you or any of your guys compete to test the skills in maybe a, a, a non-real fight situation, if that makes sense? That's interesting, actually. That, that way you've worded that is interesting. So... Um, People can choose to compete if they want to. It's not anything that's actively encouraged or um, that's supported as such. So people, if they're a student of ours, they can choose to go to Devon Open and yeah. compete if they want to. But that's the, on their own steam. Um, what we what we do do, though, um, is pressure testing. Hmm. So I'm brown belt now. A um, few years' time, I'll hopefully be invited to... I've got to go to America for my black belt test. Um, and you, you enter an an unknown room and do unknown unknown things for hours but um <laughs> yeah i've um so we we pressure test our self-defense so we'll get a uh, yuki out somebody that knows the um attacks and we'll get somebody to attack somebody um, and pressure them and they use their stand-up self-defense mm. and that could be being headlocked dragged to the floor that could be pinned against walls rear chokes so we pressure test the self-defense in that way. Mm -hmm. But obviously when people are ready and it's scalable. Yeah. Um, and with that as well, you can you can actually scale whether it's uh, technical or whether it's more more pressured where you really put it on somebody and see how they react with the with adrenaline. Yeah. So we want to see how people act with adrenaline on board, mm -hmm. how they manage the spikes. So you can do that by getting in someone's face, raising your voice, or how you grab them can make them just shudder a little bit and then see how people perform from there so there's there's a real good sort of scalable level of of testing the self-defense mm. um but you, you generally find some people also have i mean i don't know how many people have had um issues at our schools over the years um i'll, I'll keep it very generic but there was a um a friend of mine who's a police officer who was who had an altercation at work in the last few months and um, they said that they didn't actually know if they'd be there talking to me if it wasn't for their training, mm. which I think is massive. Mm. Um, and, he, and he said that he was like, yeah, it was a good test. Mm -hmm. um, and I know, I understand, I get it. And he drew a lot of experience from it. Mm. But to say that's quite big, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. It's yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting, it's an interesting one, isn't it? Because we had this conversation a few months back. So Danny did his first competition at White Belt. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't mention a white belt. Um, and, and there was a few lads actually competing mm -hmm. um, who hadn't competed yet. Yep. And I said that 
even when you roll hard, competing is, is very different. Yeah, I can imagine. Because there's a level of intensity that you, I feel you can't mimic in the gym environment. Mm -hmm. Because even though it's not a, a, a fight situation, because of the adrenaline, um, because of the nerves, you know, people, especially at the lower belt and the less technical, mm. just like go oh, mad. Yeah. And obviously you protect with a rule set in competition, so it's not quite like a street fight. Yeah. Um, you know, and there is somebody there to rescue you and you've got mm -hmm. a nice off mat and everything else, but it's as close as you can get, I think. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's why I asked the question, but do you feel that you can still achieve that level of intensity with the pressure testing that you do in the gym environment? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I'm happy with it. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy with um, with how we do it. And you, you can never fully mimic it, can you? You no. can do your best. Yeah. But um, I, I quite like something you just said there about um, when white belts start and they're all like mm. locking stuff up. That's what you get outside, though, isn't it? Mm. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, so, everyone you fight outside is technically a white belt. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> do you know what I mean? Like, so you get your white belt when you walk in the door and start, mate. So <laughs> yeah, not even yeah. that. Not even that. So think about it. Think about it that way. That's the reaction you get. So mm, very true. Um, part part of what also differentiates our style, I believe, is we don't train specifically for jujitsu versus jujitsu. Mm. Um, we don't we don't necessarily train for jujitsu based reactions mm -hmm. whilst doing jujitsu. So it's it's dealing with somebody that is a street attacker, perhaps mm. that could be that guy that just locks up with no technique that maybe throws your leg away. You've never had it thrown by a blue belt, purple belt, brown belt, black mm. belt, and you're not ready for that reaction yeah. because you think, well, hang on a minute, I've never had that. No one's ever pushed my chest before. I'll arm bar them. Yeah, it's different. Yeah, no, it is. I, I've noticed that a lot with striking over the years, actually, mm -hmm. as well, where you spar with someone who's come in and they'll catch you with a fucking silly punch or something. Mm -hmm. You're like, for fuck's sake, they shouldn't be throwing that. <laughs> yeah. But they, yeah, they yeah, catch yeah. you. It's, yeah, always, yeah. Yeah, so it's yeah. a really interesting point. Um, okay, cool. Um, mate, you mentioned when you were talking about that, that incident you had in the street where mm. you were kind of going through some mental health troubles at yeah. the time. And if you've watched our podcast, you know that the overarching theme really is men's mental health mm -hmm. and lifestyle. And we've talked in length on many occasions with many different people about how jujitsu can support mm -hmm. not just men, women as well, but primarily men with mental health. Yep. Could you talk to us a little bit about that time of your life and what was causing the mental health and how jujitsu supported you? Yeah. So, um, if we're talking about when I started jiu-jitsu or most recently? Um, yeah, maybe just touch on both. Yeah. So when I when I started training, I think it was just um, years of um, unanswered issues. Mm. Um, the classic stuff like parents breaking up and all that sort of thing. Um, and I just never dealt with things properly. And I don't think... So I'm a child of the 80s, born in 81. And I think that um, even if I say back then even till mid nineties, maybe two thousands, then um, mental health was a weakness. Mm. Like I can remember dealing with quite horrific stuff, even in the police. So, um, 2004, I joined the police, like even horrific stuff, like, um, stuff you're not meant to see and hear at all. You're not prepared for it. And I remember people like saying, you don't want the, you don't want any support, do you? Like in, in that way. <laughs> You don't, you don't want me, it's, it was called trim. You don't want me to activate trim, do you? Trauma, risk, incident management for that, do you? You don't, you don't need that, do you? And, and that's going back to like, mm. and, and, and in a professional institution. Um, so I think mental health's always been, until more recently, regarded as something that makes you weak. And, you know, you know what things are like. Um, you, you don't want to acknowledge your weaknesses. So I think you just lock them away. And I had, many years of loads of different problems. I was really badly beaten up when I was 20. Um, I, it was a case of mistaken identity. I went to a nightclub, left, and um, this lad tapped me on the shoulder, turned around, and he hit me in the face with, he had a, like an arcade roll of coins in his hand, broke my jaw straight away. And then there was three of them, and they basically stamped on my head, my groin, I had blood clots, I was in hospital, everything. I had to drink my 21st birthday meal through a straw, I remember it, like vividly. Like the pain of it, it's horrible. Um, and I had all that on board. I had sort of social anxiety issues after that mm, because surprised. it came out of nowhere. Yeah, yeah. Fireworks and stuff bothered me for years, like loud bangs out of nowhere, that sort of thing. And I think I just carried it all for years. The, the police, I really enjoyed my time in the police. And I'd like to think I was really good at it. But again, like I've said, there's a expiry date to it. So I, I always like to do or try to do work that would make a difference. Um, and 
even though you can work frontline and you can go to the jobs and deal with different things, not all of it can make a difference because the volume is too vast. You, you can't you can change it. So I, I did like a stint as a uh, sexual offences liaison officer, one of the first in Plymouth who was male. And that was responding to things like rape calls, that sort of thing. And I think that just the accumulation of all those sorts of jobs, um, you know, de dealing with stuff involving children and thing, I think it just accumulates. And I didn't vent all of it. I just kept it inside to hide my weakness as mm. it was branded back then. And it just, I don't know, kept it all in me. And it, it wasn't really until fatherhood, actually. Fatherhood changed me. My, my son came along and I just looked at myself and I was like, right, what sort of dad do I want to be? What, what sort of person do I want to be? How can I improve myself? And I'd started to address it then. And it wasn't until my um, youngest son came along, which was uh, five, four years after that. So I started that conversation myself. It wasn't until four years after that I started jujitsu. And I'd honestly say that jujitsu is the thing that I wouldn't say it's cu cured me totally, but it's definitely dissolved it to a minimal percentage. Mm -hmm. Like um, I've been diagnosed years ago with PTSD due to some stuff in the police, one particular thing in, in particular I can't go into, but that was particularly awful, like harrowing, awful. And um, that jujitsu is the only thing where I can totally lose myself in what's happening there and then. Mm. I don't have to think about anything else apart from somebody trying to fill me in. And, mm. I, and I love that. So it's like you get a holiday from your head. Mm -hmm. you, you get to just go on holiday for a few hours. You can't do anything else apart from think about just you and the problem at hand. And I think when you focus on one problem at hand, and you deal with somebody trying to fight you and you can solve it, I think it makes you realize that your other problems aren't that bad. And that actually you can sort of take those coping mechanisms from your training and implement them into what you do each day mm -hmm. and make life improve too. Yeah. And I, I try to use things like efficiency and um, problem solving from jujitsu just to help me with things like my son's condition. And, and it's just helped massively, mm -hmm. hugely. Yeah, Mushin, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, mate, tell us about your son's condition because that that you mentioned that was obviously that's a little bit mm. more recent, um, yeah. and I hadn't heard of this until we started talking. So, can you tell us about the condition and the onset and the symptoms? Yeah, sure. And then obviously how you've managed that as well. Yeah, sure. it's um, Ellis Danlos syndrome, and my son's um, branch of it is hypermobile. So his his joints are hypermobile. He's got. Um, multi-directional instability of his shoulders as well. So his shoulders basically, um, nothing's holding them in place. They just float on his back so they can pull out and come out of place quite easily. So um, onset, he's had, he's an EpiPen carrier. So he's had underlying allergies and issues um, since he was six months old, but nothing to do with his joints or bones really like that. It was all um, just to do with his allergies, breathing, asthma, that sort of thing. And it would have been middle of last year um, at training. He was just like, oh, um, this, this black belt came over his visit at the time. He said, um, sorry to bother you, your son's just dislocated his shoulder. And I went, okay, all right, I'll go and, go and help him out. And I thought, I can't hear any shouting, can't hear any noise, that's odd. So I went over to him and he's like, my shoulder feels like it's weird. Like it's not in the correct position. I felt it and it was out of place. Mm -hmm. So I took him in the change room and I said, that feels a bit weird. I said, but, um, and his arm was set back. I said, let's just try pushing that forward, gently guiding it forward, move your arm forward. And he, we did that movement and his arm just sort of like clunk, clunk, went back in place. And I was like, that was weird. It's really weird. Mm -hmm. Was he in no pain? Uh, no, just a bit of discomfort. Because I've Re dislocated my shoulder and it's fucking mm. excruciating. Re it's really weird. I I've broke my arm a couple of times. And if you, if you said to me, I've got, you can snap your humerus again mm. or dislocate your shoulder, mm. I would take the, the broken arm. Really? It's fucking mm. horrendous. And that's the thing is that I was like, turning my head to listen yeah. for noise and I was like there's no noise or anything that's that's bizarre so I, I immediately thought oh, he's all right it's something else mm. but anyway there was that and um so you okay and he was just like yeah I'm all right yeah just feels a bit a bit weird um and, and we sorry mate, how old was he at this point uh this was middle of last year so 12 yeah right, 12 okay. so um there was that and there'd, there'd been odd little things over the years that we now look back at and go oh. and it was like his thumb would dislocate here and there and you just think that's that's strange at the time and it isn't until you sort of tie everything together. You get that line of fishes and you go, oh yeah, of course. So we had that. And then it was like a week, two weeks later, it happened again. And then it was like, something's not right there. And it it went from being like, there's there's a video on Facebook that I look back now and just sort of like, 
have a different memory of it. It was his, it was, he got, he sent it from school, his thumb dislocated, putting his phone in his pocket, like his thumb tagged on his, mm. on his pocket and dislocated. And I, I did a video of putting his thumb back in to show his mum. I put it on Facebook. And at the time it was like, oh, his thumb came out. But I look back now and I was like, that's the start of all of it. That's the beginning of it. So like the memory sort of like jaded for me now. Um, and yeah, his, his joints just started coming out. It was mostly shoulders at the beginning. And then the, then the, real pain like the real dislocations that were lodged in place started and we realized we had a huge problem like it it came out of nowhere it was all a was traumatic was it both shoulders yeah actually? yeah because once you do it obviously the, the the shallow joint socket becomes loose the ligaments around it but mm. i mean yes if it's so loose it just yeah. like you said it floats on it so. and that and that is pretty much it is this like the first one two happened and then the real pain kicked in and we were at a and e not knowing what's going on, like 40, 50 hours a week. And they were like, what happened? Car accident? This? Like, no, he, he was in bed. I'm like, what do you mean? It's like, he just sat up and mm. started shouting. And it was, it was really difficult. We didn't know what was going on. It was like aliens landed and nobody knew what to do. <laughs> we had no clue what to do with this condition. And we were at A&E all the time, um, four or five days a week, both trying to work, two other children. And it was just a extremely difficult stage of our life we, we kept sort of saying this isn't right something's really wrong here he, he hasn't injured it something's going on we need help um and it was just it took a while to get the diagnosis um but in the end um they were pumping him full of all sorts and i mean like it, it was very bizarre to see like seeing a um a consultant or a, a doctor or whatever it might be trying to hang off a child's arm and pull it back. They're on their heels, all their mm. weight sitting back, trying to pull it back into place. And my son's arm, the, the muscles ripping it back out. Mm. It's ever so strange. It was like something out of the exorcist. Ever so weird to see things like rip out of place. They're pumping it full of loads of drugs, like high, high level drugs, fentanyl and stuff. And it was, um, my wife and I were just like this, something's not right here. We need to, we need to change this, it's not working. We were doing that for a month or so, going up, coming away, going up, coming away. And then we just said, right, this isn't working. Whatever this is, this isn't working mm. and we're going to change it. So we um, removed hospitals from the equation. He had so many x-rays that they said that he'd almost reached the maximum um, sort of radiation, radiation yeah. saturation point. Yeah, yeah. And he's 13. God. And they were like, yeah, he's, he, we can't x-ray him now mm. because he's had so many x-rays. Yeah, can um, I ask you a quick question as well, mate? Just when you were going to those hospital visits... And they were unaware of the diagnosis at mm. this point. Was there ever any kind of suspicion placed towards you as parents because you're bringing in a child with dislocations on a regular basis? No, no, okay, no, there wasn't. I, I thought exactly the same. Yeah. No, I, I thought exactly the same. I thought, yeah. did uh, did they raise any flags? Yeah. You know, nothing like that. Which okay. is which is odd, isn't it? As which well. is odd. Good, yeah. good yeah. and bad, yeah. I suppose. Yeah, isn't yeah. It? yeah. It's, yeah. It's, it's an odd thing, I've, I've, and I've never actually thought that until you just yeah. said that. Yeah, it's, when you said odd. that, that is exactly what I thought. I thought yeah, that, yeah. Did they would they flag that? Yeah. So. Okay. So yeah, so you took hospitals out of the equation. We took hospitals out of the equation and um, made the decision between us to manage his care at home. Okay. Um, because it didn't matter if we took him up, you know about this from clients, yeah. didn't matter if we took him up and they reset his shoulder, hour later he'll pull back out. Mm. So um, we were like, right, we're going around a big roundabout here. He's going through loads of trauma. They're pumping him full of loads of drugs. I mean, he was a mess, like a mess. And I was just like, can't do this anymore. Mm. Can't do this anymore. This isn't working. So we, we said, right. No more hospitals. So we went and sat in his bedroom and said, right, we've got something to tell you. You're not going to hospital anymore. He was like, what am I going to do? What about pain? I was like, we'll manage you at home. Um, went online, bought some high quality CBD oil and I dosed him with CBD oil. Gave him 10, 15 drops of that of CBD oil. Dosed him with that um, to help him with the chronic pain. Mm. We, we had to sit with him. Like his, his jaw would come out and like his jaw would dislocate. And um, because it was in an abnormal position, his teeth would be pressured out of place by his jaw and he'd sit on our bed all night and we'd just sit with him. <clears throat> we accepted that responsibility, mm. um, did our best for him, eased the pain as best we could, but that was better than taking him in and having this stuff pumped in all the time. It just mm. wasn't doing him any favors. Mm. And the, the after effects of the painkillers, he started asking for them. Mm. And that's when I was like, no, done. Such a young Finished. age to be yeah. like that. Oh, you say they were yeah. giving him fentanyl as well. Yeah. Yeah, fucking yeah. hell. Yeah, but yeah. we're talking like, um, four times a week we're talking yeah okay. um, and he asked for it and I was like no done yeah. he's like I need it I need that now and I was like don't so we kept him home got him through it with um, with CBD and just care at home 
and um, they put him with a very, very good physio. We had a bad experience with the physio mm. first, unfortunately. They referred him to a um, NHS physio and they didn't really have any knowledge or background of Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome. Say, yeah, and it was catastrophic. So yeah, catastrophic. Can um, and you can imagine how much that impacted his confidence mm. in the NHS um, massively. So we had that. And then we got referred to a guy called Andy Rich, who is the musculoskeletal lead for clinical care at Derriford, I think that's his title. And he was a godsend, like absolute godsend. Started off very difficult um, because we were such anxious parents because mm -hmm. if he lifted his arm up that far, his shoulder would dislocate. Um, but he, he got discharged by Andy a month ago for his shoulders. Uh, he still gets issues, but he's got mm. a lot more strength now. He can like, do press ups and that sort of thing. Um, Has he dislocated anything like major, like his hip or anything like that? Yet? No, I mean at the moment, um, I took him to the gym. So it'd have been two weeks ago on Tuesday. I took him to the gym because he was discharged with the physio. And I was like, right, we'll go to the gym and we'll do your physio to make it a bit more interesting for him. And I said, I've had a chat with your physio. We can add a little bit more weight, not much, minimal weight. So we added minimal extra weight to it. And did, did a workout together, kept it all really tight, the processes, uh, went through it all. Because I've done hundreds of hours of physio with him, so is his mum. And then um, his the day after that, it was like he'd been hit by a car. Like, and I'm talking fingers, shoulders, ankles, knees, the lot. Um, just from walking around a gym. And we only did like some shoulder work and stuff. And it wasn't a lot. Um, and it, it was like he'd been hit by a bus. Like he woke up and he was like, oh my God. And that was the last time he was able to actually get into school. So mm. he's still recovering from that. And it was two and a half weeks ago. Do you do a lot of home education with him now or is it? Yeah, it took a while to get that um, in place. Like, um, I'll be honest, a disappointing period of time to get an education in place for a child that said, I want to learn. Can you help me to, mm. his, to his teachers? They got it in place in the end, but he's now logs on to a system and has a teacher there with mm. it with a virtual class which is great it's brilliant yeah. it started off being this sort of like system where they'd send his work over mm -hmm. here and there to him in emails and all but it just didn't it wasn't enough really mm. but um yeah he pretty much homeschools he's got hybrid learning so if he can go to school he goes in if not he stays home and learns and we get him set up on his system he, he's very disciplined and good at what he does mm. so he gets on with it and we can trust him to do that now yeah. which is good God, that's awful, mate. Like as you, as you sit there talking, I just think about my own lad who's four. Mm. When he was, I think two, he, there's a really common injury. I think at that age, but he dislocated his elbow, mm. and that was bad enough, mate. Just seeing the poor little guy, just like yeah. his elbow couldn't move it and stuff. That must be fucking awful, mate. No wonder your your head was uh, a bit mashed, mate. Yeah. How do you think you would have been without jujitsu? Um, honestly, I don't think I'd be here. Really? No. No, don't think I'd be here. Too much. Mm. way too much to cope with like the old version of me the version of me that existed for jiu-jitsu wouldn't mm. have made it through that it was, it was horrendous like it dropped me to my knees many times like mm. so hard to manage and you've got your other kids as well you've got to explain it to them like mm. how do you explain your brother screaming in his bedroom mm. how do you explain that to them mm. um, and his his brother and sister are all also both hypermobile they've been looked at and stuff they're, yeah. under, they're under pediatrics because they've got traits I was about to say it's hereditary. Yeah, like so. Yeah, yeah so there's definitely something to yeah. obviously watch out for. So they, there's trait, there's traits that they've got, mm. um, and we've just got to hope that those traits don't develop into the version their brother's got. Yeah. Um, but they ask questions about that, and my my youngest son, he was training. Uh, I don't know how many months ago, three months ago, and he hurt his neck, and he screamed, um, and it was like an overreaction to just tweaking his neck muscle. Mm. He thought he was entering it. He was yeah. petrified. He was traumatized from it, um, and I had to calm him down. And mm -hmm. it's like they, they what I think because they've been exposed to it, mm -hmm. you, you have to be honest and explain it, don't you? Yeah. You can't hide it from them. No, yeah. But at the same time, you can understand why he's like that. Yeah. yeah. You know, because he sees his older brother. Yeah, exactly. Like, exactly. Yeah. Can you explain a little bit more about the, the, the actual sort of um, mechanism of the condition? So is it is it like a ligament laxity thing or is it tendons or is it it's everything? So broad, mate. It's so broad. Mm. It, again, it goes from ligaments all the way to heart problems, yeah. all the way to scoliosis yeah. and back yep. problems. And it is, it is such a, like I, I, I looked at it in length because obviously I've got a client mm. who's got it yeah. and it, it's so broad. Mm. So I, I don't know if it can mutate and, and carry on into the different areas. Mm. I don't know if you kind of, you know, you've got the hypermobility mm. sort of one 
and it, I don't know if it just stays like that or yeah. it, it can move into the other side of stuff because you can get blood problems and you uh, hyper uh, allergies, and yep. autoimmune diseases. And- yeah, so there, there's a big family of it. That's the way I understand it. Mm. And, and there's different types of conditions. Like I did an awareness drive for it back in May. I did 5,000, one in 5,000 people suffer from this. So I did 5,000 minutes of martial arts in May. It sounded good. Um, which is like 86 hours. So whilst managing my son's condition, I did 20, I actually overshot it. I did about 25 hours of jujitsu a week mm-hmm. um, for the whole month of May and raised just over two grand for uh, Ellis Danlos Syndrome, yeah, the amazing, society, amazing. which was which was brilliant. So it's a, it's a broad family. So there's different types of conditions. So our son's got what's called HGDS, hypermobile Ellis Danlos Syndrome, but there are also ones that affect um, the heart, the back, the blood. It's, it's very, very broad it was the, the best version I've had explained to us was it's a connective tissue disorder. Mm. Um, so it can affect any connective tissue in the body, which is pretty, <laughs> pretty wide ranging, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Yes. Um, so I've actually got a heart issue um, and that came to light just before Ethan um, first got sick. And um, my uh, injection fraction of my heart's low is 50, something like 54% or something. Mm. Um, I've got a thickening of the heart wall and I can't get enough blood into my heart to pump it out enough. And um, funny enough, that relates to a valve of the heart. So um, for all I know, I may have undiagnosed version of EDS. Mm. I've had problems with my knees all my life. Um, I've had breaks and stuff. I had um, something called mast cell reaction when I was a kid which is where your body reacts to um, an, a foreign body as such. So I, I was young and I just came out and these like welts on my body. Um, so that's another thing it can do, which is part of the allergy. So it'll, it'll attack what it thinks is something bad. So Ethan can sit down and eat broccoli, which would be a miracle. But he could sit down and eat broccoli and his body might go, oh, you're allergic to that now. You need to have a reaction to deal with that allergy mm. to broccoli. And that, that's how spontaneous it can be. Um, so it's, it's likely that I've I've had a degree of it. My wife's got some hypermobility as well. So it's in, in our family, unfortunately. Yeah, it's hereditary. It? And I yeah. always try and explain it to people when they, uh, the easiest way I've, I've explained it to people when they've asked about it is I'll just say, you watch Mr. Glass, you know, yep. where he, he constantly mm. breaks stuff yep. and he's in a, you know, that's it. That yep. is it in a nutshell, isn't it? It's yep. if, if they if they put their arm down too much, I've seen, I've seen my client kind of just dumb and he's, mm-hmm. oh God, and, and I'm like, hardly done anything and then mm-hmm. you really look and it's like you know his wrist is not quite right yeah like, oh. and is the is there is there kind of charities that support and that type of thing yeah so they're actually been really good so we we sort of self-function as a family mm. we don't we don't i don't use the nhs much if i don't have to yeah. like if i've got a medical condition i'll research a holistic solution like my heart problem i mentioned they looked into it i wore a tape um ecg tape and all that sort of thing and they they came back with an issue and they said to me, we need you to go on statins for the rest of your life. And I was like, no, nah, I'm good, thanks. And I, I researched something that's better than statins that I pay for every month from New Zealand that, that actually improves your artery health, that will help my condition. Because statins just maintain the status quo. Mm. So I don't want a condition that's just going to degrade over time. I want to look after myself. So we, we look at things sort of um, differently and holistically as a family. And that's how we got through a lot of his condition, I think. That's how we managed a lot of it mm-hmm. is trying to solve problems um, through healthy solutions. Like his jiu-jitsu helps him a lot. He can't always train. He hasn't been able to train for quite a while, but I, I keep him I keep him in the game. Yeah. If you know what I mean? Like I've, I've taken him to my private training with Danny and stuff and Danny's helped adapt, even moving his legs, just how to move. Like, so it's not as abrupt and impactive. Mm-hmm. Um, and that, that's made a big difference. So yeah, again, jiu-jitsu's helped with that. It's been fantastic, really. Yeah, brilliant. And you mentioned uh, a couple of your own injuries there, mm. and I saw uh, I saw some of the, um, the the kind of live stream or podcast you did with uh, the chat from over uh, BJJ over yep. forty. Might be well. Yeah. yeah, and you were kind of talking a little bit about maintaining your body once yep. you get over forty. And yep. Danny's not quite there yet. Fucking not even close. But <laughs> hey, I'm thirty four next week. Boys. <laughs> That's, <laughs> That's good. Days. That's good. But you and I are kind of the wrong side of forty yep. now. So. Talk us through what injuries you've had and how you manage your body now you're kind of the age you are. I think that it's a evolving journey. So I think that the injuries that I've accumulated were down to <laughs> sort of technical um, technical errors on my part of my training. Yeah, Best way I can put it. Yeah, like I, I, I accept full responsibility for my injuries because mm-hmm. I caused them. Um, so I understand that. Or um, I, I had one particularly nasty meniscus blowout 
years back. Um, and it was really badly timed as well. We booked like a once in a lifetime trip to Lapland. We did a day trip to no. Lapland, cost thousands. Oh no. And I went over on crutches with a meniscus <laughs> to, from a white belt. I, I guess she was, I guess she was um, the most popular in the family. I wasn't, I wasn't popular, no. I wasn't popular. My wife was really good with it. But mm. yeah, that, that was a meniscus blowout with somebody. Um, yeah, they, they put something on too hard and blew my leg out basically. Um, but apart from that, I've had, um, I'm trying to remember what it is now, C4, C5, uh, facet joint compression injury on my left. And I've had it for years and it, it causes me vertigo symptoms and things. But I only actually had it diagnosed like a month ago, which was like, mm. yay, I actually know what I'm dealing with now. <laughs> yeah. on this, It's always been looked at as soft tissue before. Mm. I've always had neck problems on my left. And um, that was, uh, yeah, ego. I'll, I'll own it now. That was ego. So we had a visitor come to the academy i'm talking back when i was a new blue belt had a lot to prove responsibility it means the world um and visitor came down and we were training headlocks in class headlock escapes and um they they were putting it on and i wanted to prove my technique was as superior it worked but at the cost of a neck injury <laughs> so um you know if i could go back in time i'd slap myself around the face and just say tell him to ease up hmm. but um yeah, you do these stupid things. Mm -hmm. And that's part of what, what caused it is just that that injury of having pressure on your neck with your head being compressed that way. I can mm -hmm. feel it crunching now. It it wrecked my neck. Um, and that, that's where my main problem, my neck's my main issue, I'd say. Mm -hmm. um, I had the meniscus years back. I've had a couple of groin tears where I've tried to like defend guard passes incorrectly mm -hmm. and split myself. Um, that felt horrible. Like all I could all I could think of is like a sausage just being cut down the middle and it all spills out. That's what it felt like. That's what, that's what my insides felt like. I, I grabbed myself at the time. There was nothing there to grab. It yeah. felt like that. It was yeah, horrible. That's horrible. Um, yeah, they they were tough to get back from, but um, I'll get injured next week. Now I haven't haven't been injured like that for quite a while. My neck plays up, mm. but I'm trying to rehabilitate it now. So um, I'm hoping I can kill that. I want to go into this. Um, this black belt test that I'll have in years to come. I want to go in fresh and healthy and good. I don't want to leave that going. I've got a black belt, but my neck's worse now mm -hmm. and I can't walk properly or anything. I want to go in and come out sort of like a better version of myself. I don't want to sacrifice any of my body for mm. for material. It's not worth it. Yeah, 100%, mate. I've, I've had a number of injuries as well. I mean, I, I probably started doing jiu-jitsu in my sort of early mid-20s. Mm -hmm. And back then I could get banged up and I'd heal up pretty quick. Mm. And I think throughout my 20s training jiu-jitsu and MMA, I had loads of knocks and I would just push on through in my, the start of training back then as well. Yeah. You know, we were learning out of these textbooks, you know what I mean? And there weren't any black belts around. I think Danny and Kenny were still kind of blue, purple yeah. belts, whatever they were at the time. And we just used to go fucking hard, mm. not with a lot of that technique. Yeah. Uh, always banged up, but always survived. And then when I hit 28, I started just getting properly injured. Yeah. And I, I, I'd always define injury by, so if you're hurt, resting for a couple of weeks, it goes away. If, if you're injured, it gets worse or it yep. remains. Yeah. <laughs> and I think it was a shoulder. I, I think I tore my AC joint, um, rotator cuff a little bit. That was the first one. Then the other shoulder. And then my ribs, I tore two in the cost. That was the worst one. And combined time of being out was probably a year yeah. uh, between them. And it, it really took the wind out my sails at that point yeah. as well. And now I, I train very differently. Mm. Um, still a little bit of a stubborn fucker at times, especially with him. Yeah. <laughs> when you catch me old tap, man, you haven't quite got there yet, but he's got close. Um, but I, you know, not just, you know, tapping, I tap early, but even yeah. just the amount of um, exertion I put into yeah. to bridging and, yep. and, and explosive movement is far less now. And I always joke with you that I'm such a lazy jiu-jitsu player mm. now because I don't want to apply myself to a point where I get injured. Yep. And do you find that's the same for you now? Do you feel that makes you just better because you're efficient though? I do, yeah. Yeah, 100%. That's, that's what it is. That's mm. what I'd say is that I, I wouldn't say that, because at times I can feel lazy, but I always go, am I safe? Yeah. Mm. That's not laziness. Like they, they can impose themselves on you, so you're still applying technique. Yeah. I think sometimes it's 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 going back to the competition thing, right? Where um someone will, I don't know, pass my guard, mm -hmm. but they can't do anything. Yep. I mean they could probably punch me in the face if they had those rules, yep. but we don't do that, so it's fine. Yep. Um so they, they, you know, I don't get submitted very often. Yep. But I sometimes lose on position. Yep. So sometimes in my head I feel like I'm doing a bad job because yep. I'm oh well, I just lost five nil there. But mm -hmm. but other than that. I'm all right. I can I see. Can I don't that. have that. There's another good difference. I don't mm. have that. Mm. So, if I'm in a position and somebody 
goes to stack me, I'll preserve the alignment on my spine. I'll go, yeah, take the pass. I'll get my guard back. Mm. Done. And that's the way it works. So I, have, I haven't got that in my head, whereas we've got different metrics. That's the best way I can put it. Mm. We've got different metrics, different outcomes. So I'll always look after myself. So last week, I'm a brown belt. Last week, I tapped to a two-stripe blue belt um, who was put on a triangle. And it's because I love my neck. Mm. Like, could I have fought through it and got out? Yeah. What would the cost have been? Would the cost have been a month off, two weeks off? Not worth it. Mm -hmm. I'd rather say, good job, mate. Because mm. he put me there. So good on him. Was I trying stuff? Yeah. And mm. you got you got to lose. I think the further you got in, I think there's a fine balance between not caring and caring too much with mm -hmm. training. Like, I'm at the stage where I care a lot about it, but I don't care enough to sacrifice um, my body. So mm -hmm. I can't train. So you've got to have that really, really fine knife edge. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I have got a rank, I've got a responsibility, but um, I can't, it means nothing if I can't train. Yeah. So I look after my body primarily yeah. and go from there. And if I'm training with somebody and they're all over the shop and they're flying around and they want a world championship match, I'll go, look, I'm 42, mate. I've got three kids. I work full time. My neck's bust. I've got bad knees. Go and train with them mm -hmm. over there. <laughs> yeah. And I'll put them with the devil. Yeah, that was that was my next question actually because we've we've got a mutual friend, um, Jero, yes, who's yep. obviously a white belt. Yep. Um, been training about a year now, I think. Yep. Incredibly strong guy. Yep. Um, and that's exactly the sort of person that I would typically avoid. Yep. Because he's he's strong as hell. Yep. Lacking in technique because he's a white belt. Mm -hmm. So it sounds like you do the same as me. You probably avoid people like that. Here we go. So what's your interpretation of how Jero trains? Give give me your um mental picture of his training session well I've, I've had a lot of conversations with him yep so it sounds like he's doing it the right way but mm. you would assume yep seeing the guy training the gym yep that he just uses strength and he's a maniac yep okay um yeah i'll, I'll say it uh jero is one of the most technical white belts i've met is he really in 10 years well done jero and and um i apart from feeling his weight yeah so i was i was looking i was doing a guard pass on him a few weeks back um, I stood, he had his closed guard around me. So we, we don't jump guard or lift off the floor. If somebody can lift you off the floor in ours, you get slammed. Mm. Um, so he was still on the floor, but hit the weight of his legs. Mm. It was literally like I had, I don't, I don't know, an immovable object around me. I was bruised for days after, mm. bruised. Gerald, Gerald doesn't train legs, does he? <laughs> I've never seen him in they a must, They must just be big I think, I think they're mechanical, mate, because he's always got them covered up. I yeah, think they're made yeah. of steel. Apart from feeling that weight yeah. of his legs and, and his obvious size, um, technical. Yeah. Technical. Oh, and I've not mate. felt his strength. Yeah. That sounds weird, doesn't it? Yeah. I, I choked him. When was that? A couple of weeks back. I'll mention that. Choked him a couple of weeks back, and it was like a punch choke. So I was mm. standing past his guard, kimono the other side of his neck, knuckling mm. the straight, pulling his gi. It took like three times longer than everybody I had to work through the muscle groups in his neck yeah, yeah <laughs> did, did it but it was tough like he's a big guy yeah no, big I'm guy. really pleased to hear that mate it's, it's great because that was almost my worry with him that he, he just muscled it but I could say the same about him actually because he's a bit of a lump he's lost a lot of weight actually but he's super technical with a white belt mm. as well we keep joking that those two should get together and roll but actually it sounds like the styles of jiu-jitsu are completely different so yeah but they still they still blend so yeah. um we, we travel, we train. Like yeah. um, there's a guy from our gym, um, Ross, you know, he'll he'll go away to work or whatever. People will go away and work. They'll go and train at a gym. Mm. And it's always that same thing. I was training. Yeah, good. We're fine. Mm -hmm. it's, it's that thing of that little, yeah, um, solid. Yeah. It, it's different sort of. I did um, Beachfront BJJ last year. Oh, yeah. I went to that. Yeah. Um, and it is a different style of training. Like there was a room of maybe, I don't know, I'll say a hundred people. Mm. And um, I had a role with this guy. And he stopped afterwards. He looked at me. He went, do you train with him? And he pointed the other side of the room at Ross. And Ross put his hand up. And I said, yeah, he said, thought so. <laughs> Out of a whole room, you could tell that we trained together. Yeah. And it's more like um, patience, control. Um, like we won't leave many gaps, mm. pre pressure. Mm. That sort of thing. It's, it's, a, it's a different sort of style. But um, like the worlds can meet. Yeah. The, world, the worlds can meet. And I, I respect everybody's training. I, mm. I think that. Jiu Jitsu is amazing for everybody. Mm -hmm. um, black belts aren't for everybody, but I think Jiu Jitsu is for everybody, yeah. if, if you can get what I mean. I don't think everybody can achieve the black belt mm -hmm. because of life pressures or whatever it might be. Like not being capable, like brown belt might be it for me. You don't know. I might never become a black belt. Mm. It isn't a given, especially in Jiu Jitsu. Jiu Jitsu is tough, isn't it? Yeah. Really tough. Like yeah. it's a hard journey. It pisses me off when people who don't know anything about martial arts and they say, they say, oh, what belt are you? And you go white. And they're like, yeah. oh, what are you doing it? Like, 
18 months or whatever. Mm. I'm like, it's different in fucking jiu-jitsu. This, this not, is yeah. it's not karate. Long haul. Like long haul. Taekwondo or yep. something where it takes like four years or five yeah. years. Yeah. And, and this is what I've said a couple of times, isn't it? Like white belts, they don't actually want a blue belt. They just don't want to be a fucking white belt. Yeah. See, I'm fine. I'm all right with it yeah. at the moment. Do you know what I mean? Like, I honestly yeah. don't give a fuck. I, I, I really enjoy no gi mm. most of the time. And then mm. if I get in the gi... But, Honestly, genuinely, my belt doesn't bother me if I'm yeah. a white belt for however long now. I just don't. I did a poll on my Instagram because I've got one of those channels now that you can have oh, yeah. um, on Instagram. Yeah. Um, I've got one of those and it's where you can directly access, access people. It's like a group chat. And I put a poll on there like if, if jujitsu changed tomorrow and the belt system went and belts didn't exist, would it matter to you? Like yes, no, or whatever. And... Um, I think two people said it would matter to them and the mm. rest were like, no, I don't care, really. I think, I think for me, the only thing that would matter is getting that black belt. Mm. Yeah. Long term, I think everyone who's got a black belt, you, like you said, they, you know they're fucking, well, in, in our gyms especially, you know that they're legit. Mm. And the achievement of 10 or 15 years worth of work, and you mm. know the shit they've gone through to mm. get that black belt, it's fucking incredible. Yeah. And that's the only thing I'd say. If it... That's the only thing I think you'd need is a black belt. So here's That's my here's one. Do, do you feel where you thought you'd be mentally as a purple belt? Because I don't feel where I thought I'd be mentally as a brown belt. Because I think that you still, you don't, you don't notice your individual progress. I think mm. that you still, I still see myself as, I'm hard on myself. I still see myself as the guy that came in and is still learning it and could always do better and this should have been done more. So... I, I always want more for myself. Yeah. But um, I thought I'd be in a bit of a different place as a brown belt than I am, actually. Yeah, it's a funny question for me because I've been a purple belt for nine years. Okay. So I've, I've been through all the, the, all yep. the emotions. Yep. Um, but before jujitsu, I, I boxed and I did Muay Thai, which it, it, it didn't have belts or mm -hmm. rank recognition. Yeah. Um, and again, it was just about application. Yeah. Um, maybe fight record, that type of thing, if you compete. And then I come into jujitsu and that was the first time really that there was a belt system. Mm. And, and again, the blue belt was really important. So was the purple belt. At that yeah. point. And belts really mattered to me for a while. Mm. And over the years of, of dropping in and out for various reasons and remaining the same belt, I'm almost completely let go of the idea of belts now because I've, I've pretty much, I mean, on and off trained for 17 years mm. and had two belts in that time. I was thinking that like you almost must find it irrelevant because yeah. you've been a purple belt for that long. Yeah. 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 Yeah, so, uh, so yeah, probably. I might add, you probably wouldn't say, but he's a very good fucking purple belt. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> like, I don't, I don't like be. it. He's been one for nine That's years. That's what I mean, yeah. <laughs> it's fucking, sometimes you think, fucking, he ain't a fucking purple belt. It does want yeah. nothing, you know? <laughs> Brown belt was really different. Like the, um, there's a video of it, but the emotion of it was ridiculous. Like mm. I got my blue belt and I was like, yay. And I got my purple belt and I was like, this is good. Really mm. happy with this. That's a responsibility. Brown belt was just emotional. Yeah, it's a big belt, it, mate. It was just like, the, the volume of it. I just felt the volume of it. And mm. I was like, right, playtime's over now. You've got yeah. to really knuckle down. I think you said off, um, when we spoke off air that you're the only brown belt at, at yeah. your club. Yeah. Why what, Why is that? Because hasn't that been going for years? Like, so, yeah. Is, Dan, is, yeah, I mean, um, I think that the self-defense syllabus mm -hmm. um, sort of like attracts certain people. There we go. So... Yeah, we roll. Yeah, we've got the self-defense. So everything, all those five elements I mentioned to you earlier have to be equally balanced for you to progress. Yeah. And I think that as some people get further in, it's just not all for them. Like the whole right, package okay. perhaps isn't for them. Maybe maybe they started and they really enjoy it, but maybe they just enjoy rolling. Mm. And maybe they want to go somewhere else and, and just do that. Um, so. And and also, I think that it's a lot, of, a lot of pressure, isn't it? As you get further in. So when I started... Um, I think it was uh, 2014, yeah, 2014 when I started. Like I've got photos going way back and I look at them and think, wow, everybody that was there then is, isn't now. Mm. Like you're the last one that's, that's left. Um, but other people from our gym have gone on to train in different places. Mm. It's just just life, I suppose, and, yeah. and challenges and direction. And I guess with anything, you, you start something and then you realize what you like. And yeah. then you can just move on from wherever. If you're yeah. happy where you are, doing the self-defense. Mm. If not, if you just want to roll, then yeah. And you don't really know when you start, do you? No, of course you don't not. Really know you, like, I didn't know the rolling existed. When they started rolling, I was like, what's this? <laughs> I, I didn't have a clue. I thought I was just going to learn how to defend headlocks and stuff. So for me, my I, I, I will always love the self-defense. And I, I do love it. Like I love the proficiency of it. I love how it works. I love how I can teach my children it. I love how my kids understand it. I think it's fantastic. Um, really enjoy it and it 
the self-defense also sort of comes hand in hand with like the escalation. Like my son's had a thing at school where somebody was um, attacking one of his friends. They actually got his friend in a rear naked choke and they were like picking him up with it. And my son ran over, broke the kid's posture, got him in a rear naked choke and said in his ear, let him go now or I'll choke you. Three, two, and the kid let go. And it's just like, I'd never told him to do that. I never mm. trained. It's just the, the ethics behind it. Mm. He was like, right, I need to stop this. I think it just breeds a nice, well-rounded person. Yeah. I really like it. Yeah, absolutely. I wanted to ask me what you would say to somebody who's maybe hasn't done martial arts, mm -hmm. maybe is considering jujitsu. What would you say to them? It's a tricky one, isn't it? Because everybody's got those things that they like. Some people like striking more. Some people like self-defense more. If you're, I, I, I always consider BJJ to be different to what I train, probably because I'm, I'm like autistic to a degree. So I'm very black and white. So for me, like I see um, sports competition and the roles on the floor and everything is BJJ. I see what I do as something totally different, like a different brand almost, like a, a different type of martial art. Actually, I'll say that, different type of martial art. Um, if, you're, if you're out there and you're looking for a way of defending yourself and you're looking for a way of increasing your confidence, helping with mental health and being safer for you and your family, then train self-defense, jujitsu for self-defense. If you're looking for an output, if you're looking for a way to help with your mental health and you want to do something that's um, good for you, fun, um, burns calories, then look at another, no, do do some um, sports jujitsu, but know what you're going to each for. Mm -hmm. That's that's what I'd say. If you want to compete, if you want to um, go to competitions and test yourself and win, and win medals, fantastic. And I respect people for doing that because I don't do it. Mm. Um, but you, you've got to know what you're after. Yeah. That, that's the main thing for me. But jujitsu universally, like universally, I'd say that it's it's fantastic. Mm -hmm. It's fantastic art. And um, I don't think there's anything else like it at all anywhere. Mm. Um, you can go for a run. You can do 10, 15K and you feel great. But jujitsu is different gravy. It's, like, oh, it is. it's so hard and it's so taxing and it's so technical and it's just so good for you. that mm. um, Even just being on the mats, like, when I went through that dark stage, I used to go in sometimes and just stand on the mats. And that was it. That was enough. Mm -hmm. That that was enough for me. Just to be in the environment and be like, yeah, it's better. I'm here now. That, that was a win. I think if something's got that much power over you, it's good for you. Yeah. Yeah. It's a hell of a journey, mate. And then finally, mate, do you want to take this opportunity to tell our audience about maybe some of your merch and, and where that money goes? Yeah, sure. So, um, it's a long journey, but I'm currently releasing some t-shirts, um, rash guards, I've done these like little accessory packs of just stickers and keyrings, and um, all of it goes to Ellis Danlos syndrome uh, directly. So I've set up some links and stuff for that. It's just setting up the shops at the minute. This is the first T-shirt ever nice. that I've had sent in the post today. Um, so they're going on sale soon. I'm working with a company called Art Marshall. So I've got like 20 of their T-shirts. Um, I've collected them over the years, love their designs, quite traditional. And I just like their clothes. And I just thought one day, try and see what they think didn't think they'd ever want to work with me because i feel small fry so i messaged them and said how would you feel about doing this with me and they're up for it brilliant which is amazing so they've been really helpful with their time effort and energy because it's not easy to work with me mm -hmm. it really isn't like <laughs> i'll wake up in the morning with 15 ideas and just like vomit them out um <laughs> on people i'm i'm re i'm a nightmare if i get something in my head i've just got to do it so they've been really, really patient with me. We've we've done lots of tweaks here and there. And yeah, so that's going to go on sale soon. I should have some links to share, which would be fantastic. And all the money goes to Ellis Danlos, which is Brilliant. great. It's already doing really well. I checked my Just Giving today just to see how I'm looking. And 2,860 now, and that's before the merchandise. So I'll keep doing charity events for it and raising money and leave it rolling. See yeah. how far I can get. Brilliant, mate. And we'll make sure we put any links that you've got down Thank in our you. description so we'll check them out. Brilliant. Thanks very Brilliant, much, mate. Thanks for coming on, buddy. Thank Appreciate you. it. Thank Thanks, you. Mate. Reach Cheers, over. Man.